this is Leith Mullah Hussein, the Radiation Oncology based in Oman and members of the Board of Advisors here at the Rice Country Council. It's my, it's give me a pleasure to introduce Dr. Claire Dempsey uh, today as a speaker and a presenter in the HDR Bracky course in Africa. Dr. Dempsey is a radiation oncology medical physicist, currently assistant professor at the University of Washington in the States, and also a senior medical physicist in Calmatter Newcastle Hospital in Australia. So welcome, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone, wherever you may be. Thank you for joining again this week. So what we're going to be covering in this session is a little bit of radiation safety that we, we started with last one. And so this will be more around directly around when you get a new source in the department and the radiation safety aspects of what to do in that situation. So just here on this first slide, it's just a picture of my hometown, Newcastle in Australia. So we have some beautiful beaches. Always welcome to come visit anytime. So I just want to, if you recall from last week, we had the poll question and it all got very confusing because some of the <laughs> questions and answers had all kind of got mixed up. So that's kind of the, the wrong answers for the question. So in the slides that I sent through to Carolyn, who hopefully you, you all got a copy of, I've corrected the question. So this is what the correct question from last week should have been. So when performing a radiation survey of a brachy treatment room, what corrections do we need to apply to the survey meter reading? And so hopefully you've all received a copy of that Excel spreadsheet that we went through during last week's presentation. And maybe some of you had time this week to have a little play with it and maybe take some measurements and see what your bunker survey results would look like. If you haven't, that's perfectly okay. okay. It's been a busy week for everybody. So that may have given you some ideas about the correct answer for this question. So the options were no corrections, but the survey meter value must be below the recommended radiation limit. Otherwise, we, the next option was corrections for source decay, overall treatment time and occupancy. The next option was corrections for source decay, occupancy and patient numbers. And then the last option was corrections for overall treatment time and occupancy. And so the correct answer for this question is part B. So corrections for source decay, overall treatment time and occupancy. I think in the presentation, there was also workload that was mentioned in one of the questions. And the thing is the overall treatment time and the workload are basically the same thing. Although workload, you generally give it as a dose rate. So milligrams per hour or week or year or however you want to put it. Whereas the treatment time is a, is a value. So in terms of hours per week, hours per year or hours in general. So if you looked at that spreadsheet, you'll see that the, we're actually using a treatment time in our survey meter reading. So, so that's the correct answer. So I just wanted to clarify that from, from last session so that it was clear for everybody. Okay, so moving on to this week, the learning objectives. This, sorry, if someone has their microphone on, if you could just mute yourself, that would be super great. Just check whether you've got yourself muted. Julia, I'm unable to like mute uh, because I'm not the host or nor the co-host. Yep. We'll just have to move on. <laughs> we'll just, I'll talk extra loud. Just so if everyone can double check that they're on mute, please. It just makes it easy for everybody to hear um, what's going on. I'll just talk. Okay, perfect. So the learning objectives for today's session is to understand the source shipping and receiving processes, including all the legal documentation and licensing issues that need to be addressed. And we're also going to look at performing leak tests on radioactive sources and the contamination surveys around a radioactive source and maintaining a source inventory in your department. Okay, so let's think. We're getting a new HDR brachytherapy unit. That's awesome, super exciting. We all love brachytherapy. It's gonna be great for our patients. We're gonna be able to do a lot of good with our brachy units. So what are the first steps you need to take? So possibly even before the HDR unit arrives in your department, there are a few things that you need to be on top of. So these things are, you know, legal documentation around radioactive source, things around source security and how you're gonna keep your source safe from 
people tampering with the source or getting access to it unnecessarily. And also considerations of radiation safety to staff and members of the public prior to starting commissioning of the, the treatment unit and also record keeping of what's going on with the source in the department. So in terms of legal documentation, again, I mentioned last week that IA had a lot of publications on their website. So if you go to that website, there's just a bunch. Okay. Thank you, whoever just muted everyone. <laughs> um, yes, I, I'm now the co-host. Oh, uh, you perfect. Can... Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's much better. So I mentioned last week that IAEA really has a lot of key documents in terms of radiation protection and safety standards and international guidelines. So I strongly recommend you go to that website and have a look at what they've got. It can be overwhelming. There is a lot of publications, but it's a really good place to start, particularly if your country doesn't have any official recommendation or legal documentation. It may be your responsibility to help develop that with, with your governing body. So. I'd suggest heading to the IAEA to look at that. So in terms of actually receiving a radiation source, your department has to be licensed and or registered for installation, acceptance, and use of brachytherapy equipment and sources for patient treatment. So to get your department registered to be able to receive a brachytherapy source and treat patients, there are several things that you'll need to provide your governing body. So that would be a facility diagram, including possibly including the shielding in the walls and this is where probably a copy of your radiation survey results would also be really helpful obviously if you haven't got your source yet you can't do a radiation survey but a diagram of the shielding and the calculations that were done in the shielding design would be required as well you need to provide your governing body information about the equipment so not only the remote afterloader that you're going to use but also measurement equipment that you have in your department any kind of treatment applicators and the purposes of the, the treatments that you're going to be doing as well. You need to provide your government information on the staff profiles. So the individual staff that are going to be handling the radioactive source. So including any experience that they previously had in handling radioactive sources. You'll also need to provide a copy of your radiation management and source security plan. So this is a this is a document that outlines basically all of your radiation management safety steps that you have. So in terms of your source security, in terms of, you know, source documentation and training for staff will all be contained in what's called a radiation management plan. Um, so our international brachytherapy source manufacturers or the afterloader manufacturers, so Varian, Electa, Bevig will not manufacture or ship a source to you unless you are a licensed department. And in a lot of countries' cases, you need what's called an import permit that's needed to get clearance of the source to arrive into the country. So my particular department, we have to get a, our radiation license updated annually. So it goes to our national body who issues us a license. And over the last few years, unfortunately, our license renewal date always seemed to fall around the time we were supposed to be getting a new source. And so we've come across a couple of times where our license is, it's not expired, but it, it won't be, it's not valid for the time they're about to ship our source. And so the manufacturer has refused to ship our source. And for an iridium source, it actually takes a month for the manufacturer to generate a source for, for a department. So if you don't have your license or it's about to expire, the manufacturer just won't make it and you'll be a month behind. You'll sort of go to the end of the queue of all the sources they need. So it's really important that you have all this paperwork up to date, particularly around the time you're wanting them to ship you a new source. So as well as the department being licensed, uh, the medical physicists, the radiation oncologists, and your RT team must also be licensed and or registered for handling the specific brachytherapy source type that you will have in your department. So if you've got iridium, they need to be licensed to handle iridium. If you've got cobalt, that needs to be included on their license as well. So that's really important. And as I said before, all countries will have different policies and regulatory bodies with different requirements. So you need to make sure that you check with your local authorities as to exactly what information you require, but every country will have something because that's what the source manufacturers require. 
they need information from your local authority to say, yes, it's it's safe for you to, it's safe for them to ship a source to your country and it's safe for you to receive it. So that's really important in terms of the legal documentation. If you don't have that right, there's no source. You're not getting one. So this is just an example of the radiation management license that my department has. So this is an older one a couple of years ago. Doesn't say a lot, but this is, this is what the source manufacturers need. They need to see a copy of this thing that we are licensed to store and to possess radiation sources for the period of a year. So it would be nice if they'd issue a license for longer than a year, but they need to check every year that we're still up to date with current best practices as well. And then this is a copy of my individual radiation user license. Obviously an old one. I do have a current one. <laughs> That one's expired. So it lists here on my license what I am licensed for. So I can use radi radiation apparatus. So that would be CT, that would be linear accelerators, a cobalt unit, superficial treatment units, all that kind of stuff for radiation oncology. And I'm also licensed to use radioactive substances for radiation oncology. So my license doesn't specifically state which sources, but this sort of condition name if you look into the finer print of what that actually means, it does specify individual source types in there. So, so that's my individual personal license to handle radiation. And this is a copy of our customs import permit for a radioactive source. So this is coming from a lector and going to my department, authorized to receive an iridium source of 12 Curie nominal activity. Obviously, we don't know the exact activity until the source is made. And so this is sent to the Australian yeah. government so that we can attempt a little bit. So, oops, I'm muted. Okay. Can everyone hear me again? Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I've mentioned source security a few times. And so what that means is you need to ensure that your radioactive source is secure from other people wanting to use it for a threat or attack or anything else. They want to steal that source and create some kind of radioactive bomb or whatever it is. They want to steal it and harm themselves with it or harm others. So it's really important that you have that radiation, radioactive source secure in your department. And so often you'll have an auditor that will come to your department as part of getting your departmental license to ensure that you do have a secure source or you have a way to secure your source on site. So in terms of when the source is transported, so when it arrives in the country to when it gets to your individual department, there'll be authorized courier or cargo companies that you must use for the source transport. And any staff that are involved in any way with source transport, so that could be the staff at the receiving bay of the hospital, anyone that's transporting the source in a truck or a car or however it works, has to be appropriately trained with how to handle radioactive material. You don't want a driver kind of turning up to your department with a super hot HDR source sitting on the seat next to them, just flopping about in the car. It needs to be secured into the vehicle. It needs to be as far away from the driver as possible, all that kind of stuff. When we're thinking about source security with an afterloader and an active source inside it, so this afterloader must be able to be secured when it's not being used clinically. So in my department, our afterloader goes into a cage with a lock on it and the keys to the cage are then held in a different part of the department that requires different keys to get into the lock, to get the keys to unlock the cage. <laughs> so it's extremely frustrating when you want to use the afterloader because you've got to unlock 15 different things, but it does mean that it makes it really difficult for someone to access the afterloader who, who isn't authorized to do so. So that's really important as part of source security. And you also have to consider when you've got a source in your department that isn't yet installed in your afterloader or you've got an old source that's just been taken out of the afterloader that hasn't been taken for transport back to the manufacturer yet. So these also must be able to be stored in a secure location. So again, in a safe or some kind of cage locked box that is also away from the public to give them radiation protection, but again, so that nobody can access it if they're unauthorized to do so. 
So it's, it's really important that you know at all times where your source is and that you know that your source is secure from anybody accessing it in an authorised way. So this is just a notification from our Environment Protection Authority talking about changes to security of radioactive sources. So if they change the conditions of source security that you need to have, then they should notify you of what their new, their new conditions are. So the government should specify to you what their source security requirements are. And if they change those in any way, they should notify you by a letter or emails or however they want to notify you. So in terms of a source registry, your local authority will need to be notified of what sources you have in your clinic. So as part of your departmental license, there might be a limit to the total activity that the department is allowed to have on site at any one time. And this could be a problem, say, if you have a source contamination issue with a reasonably new source that's highly active, and then you need to receive another source to replace that contaminated source. There may be a period where you've got two really active sources in the department, and that may be above your licensing limit. So, and it, look, it does happen. Quite a few years ago in the department I was working in at the time, we had a source that because of the applicator that was being used, the applicator had a crack in it. And so body fluids leaked inside the applicator and touched the source. So the source became contaminated with body fluids. So we could no longer use that source for any treatment because the body fluids then go into the after, like we had to pull the afterloader apart and clean it and decontaminate it. And then we had to receive a new source. So at one point we had two reasonably hot sources in the department, but it was sitting just under our department limit of the total activity. So... One thing that's really important is we need to be able to trace every single source that has ever been in the department. So if anything happens to a source, it may have left your department. You may have put it on the truck after you've done a source exchange, put it on the truck and waved it away and you go, we're done. We're not responsible for that anymore. But if at any time in the future, something happens and that source is retrieved or found or somebody uses it, the department's going to need to know where that source has been. So it's important that you keep records of every single source that has ever been in your department at any time. So it's really international, international best practice that this happens. So what we can see here... Oops. Yeah, clear, because I... No, that's okay. Old. Yes, yeah, yeah. I just get muted too. <laughs> Have, uh, like, uh, just to raise the the idea of if any participants have any question, just put it in the chat. Yes, and, please uh, type questions at any time. I will have a question for you. Like the source security and the protections might differ from HDR to LDR, from the strength of the sources, for example, for iodine, different from cobalt. So 60, for example. So yes, can you yes. some like a, a brief, short, what measures that we need? for like in comparison with the low dose HD iodine 125 versus the cobalt 60 high dose, the measures of- uh, Look, I mean, they're, they're quite different. I mean, this course is really only covering HDR. So I sort of hadn't prepared anything on LDR sources. So obviously LDR sources are completely different. So, you know, you can kind of get up close and personal with an LDR source, whether an HDR source, that's a really dangerous thing to do. Right. There, there still needs yeah. to be a level of source security with LDR sources. And in some ways, it's probably more dangerous because often when you get an LDR source delivery, you get a lot of sources. So you get a cobalt source, you get one. So it's kind of easy to keep track of that one source. Whereas right. if you're, say, doing prostate seeds or anything like that, you'll get a delivery of many, many sources. Right. And so keeping track of many, many sources at once is really, really difficult. So it's really important that the, the vials and the packaging that those LDR sources come in, the integrity of that is always checked and maintained as well. That's probably the, the big thing with LDR is just the, the difference in the number of sources you actually receive when you get them. Uh, there's a question in the chat about the safe transport of iridium-192. Mm -hmm. As an example, can you yes. just a brief uh, description about the safe transport of iridium 192? Yes, yeah. So, when say the iridium arrives by 
airplane in the country and it goes through you get your customs clearance because you've got all your documentation in place and that's all great. You should be in contact or the manufacturer, actually. It's really important that you are constantly talking to the manufacturer. So for Iridium, let's say we're working with Elector. Okay, so Elector should arrange the transport from the whole way from the time it leaves the, the source manufacturer. So from the time it's created and it's flown to your country and goes through clearance and then it's picked up by an authorized courier and delivered to your department, the manufacturer is, is kind of responsible because it's not your source yet. It's the manufacturer's source, if that makes sense. So once you receive the source in your department, it becomes your source. But until that time, that source is actually still the responsibility of the, the source manufacturer. So Electa in this case, or, you know, which, whichever company you're using. So in terms of transporting a source to the department, the manufacturer tends to take that responsibility. But what will happen is hopefully they've got an authorized courier and it's important that that courier they're driving a car or a truck, that the box or the container that the Iridium source is in is firmly strapped down. So they have said not necessary to have an armoured car. No, you know, you, you don't need to have police escorts or anything like that. It can just be in a car. I think the less attention you draw to the source delivery, the better. Um, if you have a, you know, flashing sign going radioactive material inside, you're just drawing attention and that's when people are going to want to try and compromise the source security. So, so you'd have question. a courier, sorry. Another question, how to keep track of a source that has left the department? So again, once the source leaves the department, it then becomes the responsibility of the manufacturer once again. So really your responsibility is to make sure that the courier collects the source and you would take note of who that courier is. And then as long as the records of the source leaving your department, that you've got a record of that, then that's really all you can do so so if the source gets lost lost in transit you can show that your records show you handed the source to mr smith or whoever it is this date and this time and the source was taken from you at that point so that's that's the records that are really important for you to keep so so for example in my country when we have a change of source we have to send a, a document to our health authorities again that says here's the, the source that we've sent away and here's the source that we've received in exchange. So you'll put the source serial number on it, the activity of the source at the time, and then the, the serial number of the new source that you've received in exchange. So that obviously do that document doesn't get sent to the authorities until you've done a source exchange. So until the new source is in the afterloader, and the old source has been taken away by your authorized courier. So for so as an example, here's, here's our source movement record or, you know, a, a sample of, it doesn't have to be complicated. Again, an Excel spreadsheet is perfectly fine. So in our source movement record, we just put the source serial number, what the reference air coma rate was on the source certificate and the calibration date of that source. We, we put the date that the source arrives in our safe. So in our department, it, it arrives in our department, it goes into a safe. Then we record the date that it goes actually into the afterloader. So you can see in this top line, you know, the source was calibrated on the 19th of January. We received it on the 2nd of February. And then we installed it into our afterloader on the 3rd of February. Then on the 5th of May, we took the source out of the afterloader and put it back in the safe. And then on the 16th of May, the source was returned and here was the courier's name and this was the courier company that took our source from us. So really that's, that's all the information you need to have, but it, it's really important that you keep that record because at any time, if anything happens and somebody finds a source, they need to track where it's gone just to make sure that nobody's been inadvertently exposed. So, so that information is really helpful. Okay, so hopefully we can now do our first poll question. So, so the question, I'll just leave it up here and then I'll stop sharing so that we can actually have the poll. So what information does a manufacturer require before they will ship a HDR source to your department? 
So is it A, a clinical department license, which is provided by your state or federal authorities? Is it licensed staff for the purposes of providing treatment? Is it a secure place to house the HDR source or an approved radiation management plan? Okay, so I'll stop sharing. And so here's our poll question here. So have a go. So we have uh, till now 30% of participants. So make it, we'll reach it uh, like 70 and then we can close it. Okay, I won't answer it because I already know the answer. <laughs> okay, so it's one of those, one of those options. Yes, so. Now we are approaching 70 and cross the one minute. So I will stop here. And how did we go? All right. So can I see the results? There we go. Oh, look at you all, legends. Everybody <laughs> knows their stuff. Great response. I love it. All right. I will start to share my screen again. Okay, so here is our question. And you're all awesome. Or well, 89% of you are awesome. The others were probably half asleep or something. Yeah. So <laughs> there was a question in the chat and I replied it. Uh, the question mm -hmm. was concerns that terrorists or criminal groups could gain access to the high activity radioactive source and use these sources. Uh, Maliciously. So I like I answered the question was who will punish like the criminal or so I mentioned in this case the police and the official authorities. Absolutely. Yes. 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 That's that's as much as I'd like to punch him in the head, that's not my job. It's, yeah, it's it's absolutely the authorities. Um, the, the legal authorities and the police will deal with that. About the procedures of receiving the iridium 192 in the airport. Any special advice oh that's a good question i couldn't i couldn't tell you though because i'm not involved in that particular part of the process so you know i think my assumption is you'd have customs people at the airport who are specialized in radioactive material handling and they would probably you know as as everything coming into the apartments probably get gets x-rayed and they look at it they probably do their own radioactive tests wipe down the box, hold a survey meter around it to make sure it's not too hot before releasing that to the authorized courier to take it to your department. But to be honest, I don't know because I don't have to do that part of the job, thankfully. So, but I would assume every country would have some kind of radiation or authorized radiation handler at the airport to deal with these things. All right. Okay. Thank you. So great job with the polls. People are listening. I love it. Okay, so we've got our license, our department license, we've got our personal license, we've got our source security places, all our cages, all our keys, everything's done. Our HDR units installed and our sources arrived. Can we start commissioning? Can we just leap in and start commissioning the unit? So what we need to do first is ensure that during commissioning, that all of our staff, including ourselves and all of the members of the public and our patients are safe during the commissioning process. So what we need to do when accepting our first source is look at leakage radiation of the afterloader. We do our bunker and our room survey that we discussed last week. And then we make sure that all the radiation safety systems of the treatment room and of the treatment afterloader are all working. And then we also consider personal radiation safety. So next few slides, I'll just go over what these things entail. Okay, so accepting a radiation source. So when your source arrives in the department, there are several things you need to check to make sure it's safe to put inside the afterloader. Okay, so this is, you know, source has arrived, you've signed for it with the courier, you've put it into your source tracking spreadsheet, okay, and you've locked it away in a safe. And now you're ready to put it in the afterloader. Okay, everyone's free, department's free, got your engineers on site, ready to go. So there are a few things that you need to check to make sure it's safe to put in, in your afterloader. 
So we need to check the radiation levels on the outside of the source transport container and also on the outside of the source container that sits inside the transport container. So sources tend to arrive in a big plastic bucket, kind of looks like, and then the source itself sits inside another lead shielded container inside that plastic bucket. So we want to check the radiation levels outside on the plastic bucket and also inside on that source container itself. We need to check that the serial number that you get with your source certificate. So normally the manufacturer will email you or, or post a copy of your source certificate. So you should have a copy of that before the source arrives in the department. So you need to check that the serial number on your source matches the source certificate that you've received from the manufacturer. So you, you need to check you've got the right source basically to start with. And then you want to check that there's no tampering with the source container or the source. Okay, if you're, there are special tamper, tamper proof tabs on the plastic bucket that the source comes in. So if those tabs are broken, don't touch it. Don't touch anything. You call a manufacturer and you say, the tamper tabs are broken. What should we do? Okay, because it means that somebody has tried to open the bucket when they shouldn't have. So, oh, so the, there's a container serial number and a source serial number. We need to make sure they're both as they should. And we need to check that there's no contamination of the cable that the, the source is attached to or the source. And we can do that with what's called a wipe test. Okay. There's a question uh, clear in the chat. Mm -hmm. How can one ever suspect a source contamination? I'm going to cover that because this will suspect it once we start doing our measurements. And if our measurements are re high readings, then we'll know that there's been a source contamination. Another um, question about the IATA requirements for transportation of radium, uh, of radiation sources that the physicist shouldn't be aware about. Well, they, they probably should be aware of all of the requirements. So that IATA document, you should just have that as a reference so that you are aware of all of the requirements of transporting a radiation source. So as a physicist, I think we need to, whilst there are some things that we don't manage, I think we should still accept some responsibility for it, even if it really isn't our responsibility. I always get nervous in those moments where the manufacturer says, we've shipped the source to you. Um, I always hold my breath until I see that source arrive in my department. Because um, even there's, there's nothing I can do about it, I still feel a sense of responsibility. But knowing the, the IATA requirements, I guess, goes a good way to, towards giving you a little bit of, yes, making you feel a little bit better about what's happening during all the transportation processes as well. So I'd suggest reading whatever you can on all of this. Also, Hiba Ahmed raised her hand to have a question. So go ahead, Hiba. Are you hearing us? Or maybe her, un her question was answered. Anyway, so you can continue, Claire. Okay. All right. So the, the, the important thing is, and if you take home nothing else from this presentation, you never, ever, 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 ever accept a source that does not match the documentation that you've received from the manufacturer that is outside the radiation level tolerance when you do your measurements or that you suspect is contaminated. Okay, you never, ever accept that source. Now, it may be that the sources in your department, the courier is long gone, but that doesn't mean you go, okay, well, we've got it. We're going to have to use it now. So when I say accept, I mean, you don't ever put that into the afterloader. You do not ever put a radioactive source into a treatment afterloader if it doesn't match documentation, if it's outside radiation tolerance, or if you suspect that it's contaminated. Okay, key point. If you learn nothing, remember nothing else about any of my presentation, that's the, that's the key point. Okay, so in terms of accepting irradiation source, you'll have some different stickers and documentation that you need, that you'll see uh, when you receive it. So this is the plastic bucket, I guess, that I've been talking about. And it will have a radioactive sticker on it. And it will have, it should have, you can continue now, okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So this radioactive sticker is custom customized for your particular source that you're getting. So it should have the source activity in Gigabecquerel written on the sticker, and then it will have a number in here, which is called the transport index. 
So the transport index is equal to the dose rate one meter away from the source. It's normally given in millirem per hour. Sometimes it's given in microsieverts per hour. And it's important to note this transport index is rounded up to the first decimal place. So if they've measured a transport index of 0.11 on the certificate, on, on the sticker, it will actually say 0.2. So they kind of overestimate. Again, overestimating in radiation safety is good because it means you're more safe than, than you should be. And this transport index value should always be less than 0.5. Okay, if it's more than 0.5, it means your source is, is too hot and, you know, it, it, there's probably something wrong with it. And then this is the, the inner container that comes inside your transport bucket and it will have another sticker on it that'll give, you know, the model of the, the source or the outflow you're putting it into, the serial number of the source, the activity, the reference air camera rate and a date of measurement. So this sticker should match the source certificate that you've received from the manufacturer. So if those two things don't match, you put it all aside and you call the manufacturer and you say, what's going on? I've received the wrong source. Okay. Okay. So when we get our source, we need to check whether the, so we will get our source and we'll have it in the bucket. We'll do our tests, which I will show you in a spreadsheet shortly. And if that's all okay, we pop the source into our afterloader. So once it's in our afterloader, we need to check that the afterloader doesn't have leakage. So we need to check that the afterloader has been manufactured correctly. So this is for a new afterloader. Okay, you've received a new afterloader in your department. You've got your source, it all seems okay. You put your source into the afterloader. Now we need to check that the afterloader has been made correctly. Um, so that the internal shield in the afterloader is correct, that the source drives into and out of the, after, the internal radiation safe correctly. So we need to check all of those things. And again, if you find deficiencies in any of these tests, the afterloader may be faulty or it may have been manufactured incorrectly. So it may have to be returned. So again, never, ever, ever use a treatment unit that has unacceptably high leakage coming out of it. It's a danger to you. It's a danger to all of the staff. It's a danger to the patients because it means that the area around the afterloader has too much radiation present. Um, so what you'll all receive in the coming week is another Excel spreadsheet that sort of goes through the checks that you should be doing when you get your new radiation source. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing this screen. And I'm going to share the spreadsheet. Okay, can everyone see this? Okay, so you'll all receive a copy of this spreadsheet. And it's not, it's not super complicated. There's not a lot of stuff in it. It's less complicated than the survey uh, spreadsheet. So this should be pretty easy to follow. Again, there's a tab with an introduction about what all this is about. There's another tab with some instructions about how you do these measurements, okay? So when we're talking about where should you take your survey meter readings from, it's all in the instructions and, and what the tolerances are are all in this instructions tab. So here's our radiation safety check spreadsheet. So again, we've got our isotope here. So you can select iridium or you can select cobalt and the half-life will automatically be calculated. You can put in this, the ID of the radioactive source that you're putting into your afterloader and the reference air coma rate from the source certificate. You can put the activity in as well, if you like. Maybe you want to put it in Mega Becquerel if that's what's been written on all your activity stickers. Feel free to do that. It's always not, we don't actually need uh, the certification date and time, but it's always nice to have that in the, in complete record so we can put that in as well and the measurement date and time of when you've actually completed these measurements so again you know if you just highlight over the red triangles you'll see just some information about each of those in here you can put information about the survey meters that you're using the calibration dates and you'll also need to get a background reading from your survey meter just because these readings are going to be hopefully really, really low. So you do need to take into account what background is to make sure that you're not just reading background as opposed to something more meaningful. So when your source arrives, 
You can do some physical checks. So is the shipment box damaged? Hopefully the answer is no. Um, those tamper seals, is the uh, are the tamper seals okay? And is there a radiation material sign on the door? Okay, so wherever that radiation uh, container is, there should be a notification that there is radiation present. Okay, because in that box, uh, whilst your source is in the shielded container, there is quite a lot of activity in that plastic bucket. So I know when we receive our bucket, it's and it's heavy too. So it's not like you can just pick it up. So when we receive our bucket, I tend to get a trolley and put the, the bucket on a trolley and then push it as opposed to trying to carry it with my hands just to avoid, you know, extra radiation. Keep the source, you know, time distance shielding. So just keep this, the source as far away from you as you can whilst you're moving around the clinic. So here we now look at the source in the container. So this is the source in the bucket and then the source in the container inside the bucket. So you probably have a, radio, a radioactive material too. This one's a sticker for three, but generally they tend to be radioactive two stickers. They're just different categories of radiation. So here's the label or the transport index that we talked about in millirem per hour. So that's the number that will sit in this box, the transport index. Okay, and then you get your survey meter and you get a reading one meter away from your source in the container. So if we come over here, there's a really long explanation about how you do each of these steps, um, which is basically the, the same as the instructions tab. So if you click on that, so, so you first measure the highest radiation dose at about a metre from the surface, not using an iron chamber, using a survey metre. And then there's just information about if it's a radioactive one or radioactive two or three sort of label on the package. So you've got the source in the container, you stand about a metre away and you start walking around and getting your readings could be microsieverts, could be a millirem, just taking note that one millirem is 10 microsieverts. So you might have to convert these tolerances here. And so you, you find what the maximum reading is. So in this case, maybe it's three microsieverts per hour and the tolerance is five. So I've kind of tried to make it tricky. So let's say we read six, your box will turn red to say, actually you're over the tolerance. If five, five is okay, three is better. So, so that's just holding your survey meter, meter away from the source whilst it's in the container. So then what we can do is we go a little bit closer. Okay, so we're a meter away from the container. We're all okay, it's all safe. So then we start to get closer to the container. And we take measurements at four cardinal positions around the container, both at, at one meter, which is the same as this one. Okay, that's our maximum reading. And then we go one centimeter away from the container. And you can see our tolerances have gone from microsieverts to millisieverts because we're getting so much closer to our source. Our readings are going to be hotter. So a centimeter away, these points around your container and just making sure again that they're within tolerance. Then we can do what's called a wipe test. So there's an instruction here. So you get some dry filter paper or other material and you wipe down. There's several things you can do. You can wipe down the surface of the container and get a reading from that. And normally the engineer who does the source exchange will also wipe down the cable that the source comes with and we'll do a wipe test with that as well. So from a physicist's perspective, you'd be wiping down the outside of the container as part of your wipe test and the engineer would do the white test of the actual source cable. So again, you get a reading in decays per minute per centimeter squared, and the tolerance there is 22. So again, that little text box there explains what you need to do for that test. Okay, so all of these, when all of these have been done and you're happy that your source is okay, it doesn't appear to be any contamination of the source. You can then put your source in, or the engineer can put the source into the afterloader. Then once it's in the afterloader, we do some more measurements. So we do it 10 centimetres away from the outside of the afterloader at five different points. So front and back, on top, and on each side of the afterloader. We've got a tolerance of 10 microsieverts per hour from the surface of the afterloader. And as long as your results are within the tolerance, then you can assume that your afterload has been made correctly 
that the shielding, the afterbloater is all okay and you're ready to move on to the next steps. Claire, there's a question regarding the sheet from Saleh. With regarding to activity that is on the sheet, is it the initial activity at the time of the shipment or activity at the time of the company? So this would just be from the, the source certificate. So that would be at the time of uh, shipment. So, um, so then, yes, so at the time of shipment is the reference air camera rate. So that's from your source certificate value. And then you can just put the measurement date and time in there just so that you know when you've done the measurements, basically. So we don't need to determine decay for any of this. Decay is not a, an, a, not an issue because these tolerances are set based on, on an average decay anyway. So I'd have to double check those of you that have cobalt machines, I may have to double check as to whether the tolerances are the same. They may be slightly higher, but let me check that and I'll see if I can, before I send out the spreadsheet, if it's, if it's different for cobalt, I'll make sure that's included in the spreadsheet as well. Just let me double check that before I send it out. Okay. Are there any more questions about the spreadsheet before I go back to the presentation? Oh, there's one question. Oh, there's quite a few. Okay. What is the tolerance of contamination? So the tolerance here is 22 decays per minute per centimeter squared. So that's when you take a measurement of that piece of filter paper that you've used to wipe it down. That's that's the way the contamination measurement is, is done. And Nicholas has a question. Do I specify to the manufacturer what source activity my department requires? Or is this dependent on the manufacturer? Then more, how do I independently check the source activity upon arrival of the source? Perfect. Good questions. So the manufacturer will know what your source activity requirements are. So that will be a discussion that you have with them when you purchase the afterloader and the contract that you have with them to provide the sources to you. So the manufacturer will know all of that. The manufacturer will have a copy of your department radiation license. So they will know what your department is legally allowed to have in, the, in their department as well. So they'll make sure that they meet all of those requirements. And then the second part of the question, how do I check the source activity upon arrival of the source? You can't check the source activity exactly until you do a source strength measurement. So that won't happen until after you've put the source into the afterloader, okay? And that will be covered in next week's lecture, I believe, where we then start to look about how we verify the activity or the source strength of the source we have in our afterloader. So that will be covered next week, if you can sit tight. Another question, if the server meter is large volume iron chamber, do we take the max dose rate or the average dose rate? Take the maximum dose rate in that case, yes. So... And then a question, how do you carry out the wipe test? So what you have is like a little square of paper. And normally the engineer will have the equipment to do the wipe test because they do the wipe test of the cable. So I tend to rely on the engineers and all of their equipment to do the wipe test. So they'll have little kind of pads of, of paper and we'll just wipe it over the surface of the container. And then they'll have a... a like a reader that you put the piece of paper into and it will give you a reading of decays per minute per centimeter squared. So you'll do that contamination test on the outside of the container first to make sure that there's no contamination outside the container, which may imply that there's contamination in the container and contamination in the source. And then the, math, the engineer that installs the source will check the source cable itself to make sure that there's no contamination there. So does that make sense? And reading of dose outside the source container. Yes, that's done with your survey meter. So it should give you a microsievers per hour or a millirem per hour kind of reading. And that's what we use for our tolerances. So I will stop sharing that and I will go back to the presentation. Okay. So you'll all get a copy of this once I've double checked that the tolerances are the same for iridium and you can have a play with that as well. Okay, so once your source is installed into your afterloader, you can do your source strength measurement 
okay, which will be covered next week. And you also do your bunker and your room survey, which we, we discussed last week. So when you do your room survey, we, we're testing whether the shielding of the room is actually up to the standard of the room design by doing the radiation survey. And again, when you get your source, your very first source, if you find deficiencies in your radiation shielding, you need to fix them before you can do anything else. So you can't com can continue commissioning. You need to fix the deficiencies in your bunker shielding first. That would be your number one priority at that point. So, and there's just some examples of, of what you can do if you find deficiencies. So just the, the last thing that I was going to cover today, I think it's the last thing, is the other radiation safety systems that are incorporated into your treatment room and also into the afterloader itself. Okay, so these are a few things that, that you should have ready to go in preparation for receiving your first source. So like a linear accelerator bunker or a cobalt external beam bunk, we need to have independent radiation monitors and radiation indicators. So there needs to be on the wall an independent radiation monitor, so an area monitor. And this will be inside the bunker and you'll have, you'll often have a a monitor screen outside in the treatment console area and it will just show you when your source is outside of the safe. So it's a really nice way to know when you stop doing a brachytherapy treatment that that source has retracted out of the patient and has returned back into the afterloader and that it's then safe for you to enter the room, okay? Because when you're doing brachytherapy, if you hit the off button, it's not an automatic turn off. The source has got to come out of the, the applicator, go all the way down the transfer tube and go into the afterloader. So at that point, that's when it's really safe for you to walk in. So having an area monitor is a really useful tool to let you know that it's safe to enter the room after the, the source has been retracted. No questions in the chat. <coughs> mm -hmm. Have there been cases where shipment of sources has been delayed owing to depreciation of the activity of the source? If yes, what do you do in those instances? Oh, good question. So this is particularly, I think this has occurred a lot because of COVID. So for example, my department was supposed to receive a source back in 2020 and sort of, you know, mid 2020 when COVID was really it, the whole world was in a panic and everything was shutting down. So our source is manufactured in the Netherlands. And it, when it flew from the Netherlands and landed in Dubai, and then it didn't go anywhere. And it sat in Dubai and it sat in Dubai and it sat in Dubai for probably about two weeks. You know, every day we we're calling going, where's our source? What's happening with our source? Why is our source still there? And the issue was there were no flights. You know, there was no flight from Dubai to Australia. Everything was shut down. So it, it, it took two weeks for our source to come from Dubai to Australia before we could install it. So obviously, yes, the source is decaying at that point. So when we received it, it wasn't as, as hot as we'd normally get, but you can, you can still use it. Okay. You can, you can still use that source. Maybe we did, I think we did a source exchange in a shorter period of time to make up for that that lower lower source. I don't know if there's anyone in this group from Zambia, but I was talking with them in 2020 and they couldn't get a source into their department for almost a year because borders are closed and, and whatever. And so the the current source they had in their afterloader got so low, the activity got so low that the machine actually wouldn't let them treat patients. And you know, I think Normally a brachytherapy treatment is about 10, 15 minute treatment. By the end, their treatments were going over an hour and you start to get radiobiological issues and whatever. And the machine actually just went, you can't treat with this source anymore. The activity is too low. So there's absolutely been cases of delayed shipping and, and that impacting departments. Another question, if the value after the wipe test is more than the tolerance value, what should be done? Good question. Again, like I've said, if anything is above tolerance, you put that source back into a safe that's shielded and you contact the manufacturer and you say, I think our source has contamination. What do we do now? Can you please come and collect it? Or, you know, you need to send us another source. So at that point, you contact the manufacturer and you have a conversation with them about what the next steps will be. But absolutely that source 
will need to be returned. It's not something that you can use if it's got contamination. Another question, can one use cotton gauze with alcohol for the wipe test? I think you could use dry cotton gauze, but alcohol, I think that because you're getting contaminated dust particles really off the machine, I think if you have alcohol on it, it might dilute or shift around the dust particles. So it tends to be a dry, a dry pad or wipe that you use. Does a lead apron need to be put on in case of wipe test? Yes, lead aprons always help. I know our engineers don't use lead aprons, but I think the safer you are, the better. So if you have the opportunity to have a lead apron, you should, you should be using it at this point because at the moment it's all unknown. You don't quite know what it is you've got yet. So safety first. And I would say, yes, use a lead apron. How can we read the white tests and the contamination? Again, the engineer should have, there's a special machine that will give you that decays per minute off your wipe test as well. Okay, so going back to this, this slide here. So we've got our radiation monitors in the case we have an, an area monitor that will tell us as staff when it's safe to go in the room. So when the radioactive source has returned to the after loader, uh, a beam on light is obviously essential to let everybody know that there's radiation in the room. So that beam on light should come on the second that source starts to leave the after loader and the beam, on off, the beam on light will turn off the second the radiation source is back inside the afterloader. So not at the conclusion of treatment, but after the source has traveled back into the afterloader. And you also will, one of our national recommendations is you need to have a sign on the wall that indicates you have a permanently active source in the room. Okay, and this is probably not such a big deal for those of you that have cobalt external beam machines because it's the same thing. But for departments like mine where we have linear accelerators, so when the linear accelerator isn't on, there's no radiation risk. Okay, anyone can walk in and out. But with brachytherapy, when you have an active source, it's, it's always on. So you need to have a sign to indicate that there is a radioactive source that's permanently putting out radiation inside that room. And again, much like a external beam bunker, we need to have audio visual system so the patient is able to be seen and heard at all times. And also that the patient is able to hear the clinical staff when necessary, particularly, particularly because brachytherapy treatments are much longer than external beam treatments. So brachytherapy patients can be alone in the treatment room for 15 to 20 minutes. And that can be quite distressing for them. So they need the opportunity to be heard and for you to speak, be able to speak to them in that, in that time frame as well. In, in terms of the interlocks that you get on a brachytherapy unit and a brachytherapy treatment bunk, like a external beam, you have an emergency stop button. So this button will retract the source as quickly as possible into the radiation safe inside the afterloader. You have a treatment interruption button, which is very similar to your emergency stop, but the treatment inter interruption button maintains more integrity of the, the actual treatment you're doing, and it doesn't retract the sources quickly. So you'd use an emergency stop if there was a medical emergency, you know, the patient was trying to jump off the bed, emergency stop, things need to happen quickly. If your patient is getting distressed and you need to go in and calm the patient, you'd use the treatment interruption button. Okay, so there's sort of two different scenarios. Interlock. There's obviously going to be a door interlock. You don't want people walking into the room while the radiation source is out. So you would have a door interlock as well. There's an interlock in terms of the transfer tube connection. So to get from the applicator in the patient to the afterloader, there's a transfer tube that transfers the source between the afterloader and the applicator. If this transfer tube isn't connected properly, either at the afterloader end or at the applicator end, it should give you an interlock to say that this, this isn't functioning correctly because if they, if they disconnect, then obviously you could have a HDR source just flying around, the, <laughs> flying around the room or getting stuck in the transfer tube as well. The last few things in terms of safety systems is backup power. So a lot of the brachytherapy afterloaders have a battery backup to their afterloader. So if you have a power failure, which I know for some of you is, is more common than others, what that means is the battery can retract the source in the, in the case of a power failure. So the, the battery can either complete the treatment for that patient or 
the battery can either retract the source and pause the treatment until you can get power back. So that's really important system in a brachytherapy oscillator. This next point, the shielded emergency container for the source is a little bit contentious. Some people say you have to have one. Other people say not necessary if you have the ability to, to close off your treatment room. So the shielded emergency container is if, for example, your source gets stuck outside of the afterloader. So you're having a patient who's getting treated, the source is driven out through the transfer tube, it's in the, inside the applicator, inside the patient, and it gets stuck. Okay, it's not moving, you can't get it out. So what you need to do is go in the room, get that applicator out of the patient and put it inside the shielded emergency container and then close off the room and call a manufacturer or an engineer to get help. So some people say the bunker, if it's shielded properly, is a shielded emergency container, whereas others will say, no, you need this specific. So this is a, a picture here of a shielded emergency container for an elector afterloader. So I think if you have, as long as you have the ability to lock your treatment room so that nobody can go into it, the shielded emergency container is probably less important than some of these other systems. But certainly if you have one, if you have a shielded emergency container, that's brilliant. By all means, have it next to the bed for every single patient treatment you do, just in case. And then the last one here is the ability to manually retract the source. So for example, uh, our source is stuck in our patient. Okay. The machine's tried to withdraw the source. It doesn't work. You know, the first thing you can do is you can go in and there should be a manual source retraction. So often it's a handle that you wind the back of the, the afterloader somewhere. So you can manually try and wind that source back into the afterloader. So if the after if the source ever gets stuck in the afterloader, the first thing you do is try and manually retract it. Because obviously trying to get an applicator out of a patient can be quite distressing for a patient. So if you can manually retract the source, then that buys you some time to then get the patient off the bed and do all your radiation safety checks. So there's some radiation safety systems that are built into the afterloader, as well as things that need to be taken into consideration in your treatment bunker. There are three questions in the chat. Yes. So if you can... So what is, who is responsible for the source position error? So that will be covered in the next couple of weeks in terms of source positioning. So if the source isn't quite in the right position, the manufacturer can train physicists in order to adjust the source position. That is something that can be done. Or if you have an engineer on site, they can be trained up to adjust the source position as well. So if you get a source position error, that just means that your, your, the cable that drives the source out is saying it's not quite in the right position. So that, that can be adjusted relatively easily in the software of the, of the afterloader. And the next question, in case of a source is stuck, would you advise someone to cut the source guide tubes or just put it direct in the emergency container and call the engineer to re retract the source after patient evacuation? It's a really good question, James. Historically, they've always said you have this emergency kit next to the patient. And if the source gets stuck and you can't manually retract it, then you should cut the transfer tube and then put, you know, the source into your emergency container. Things have changed and recommendations now are never, ever, ever cut a source transfer tube or a source cable. Cutting By cutting the source cable, you've now introduced an uncertainty as to where your source is. Okay, if the source cable is still attached to the afterloader, you know where your source is. Once you start cutting that cable, it could go anywhere. So, so the recommendation, the international recommendations now is you never cut the source cable. So if the source was stuck and you couldn't manually retract the source back into the afterloader, you would take the applicator out of the patient, put it into your emergency container or put it on a chair, take the patient and all of the staff out of the room and lock the room. And then you call the engineer and the manufacturer to come and fix this problem. <laughs> okay. As a physicist, it's not our responsibility to fix that. That's an engineering problem. <laughs> okay. Our job is to make sure everybody is safe. 
So our job is to make sure the patient is out of the room, make sure the staff are out of the room, that the room is sealed and that nobody can go in that room unless you are an authorised person, an engineer or, or the manufacturer to do that. But what um, then the question, Chad, uh, ask what about the maximum tolerance of contamination that can be accepted? So on the spreadsheet, the maximum tolerance there was 22 decays per minute per centimetre squared. So that's the, the maximum tolerance from the contamination test. Yeah, so that's on the, the Excel spreadsheet that you... And uh, finally, Abu Adibo uh, asked what was the energy range of scattered radiation of contaminated iridium-92. Oh, wow, that's a really difficult question. I don't think I can answer that. Given that iridium-192 has such a broad energy spectrum, I couldn't say exactly. It, it could be, you know, it could be you have a small part of iridium-192 that's sitting outside of the, the source and is attached to the cable somewhere where it shouldn't be, in which case the energy range would be the same energy range as the source mm -hmm. itself. So that's it's a really difficult question. I'm not sure I can answer it <laughs> properly. I would say anywhere between 5 keV and 500 keV as a, as a vague guess. But yeah, it, it would depend on what the contamination was made up of, to be honest. So on this slide here, we're talking about personal radiation safety. So I talked at the start about a radiation management plan, which was required as part of your departmental license. And we've already discussed an independent area radiation monitor, all these things are important in keeping yourself and staff safe. Another thing that's really helpful is having a personal dose. So normally as radiation staff, we've got our radiation dosimeters that we wear every day when we're at work to monitor our own radiation dose. In brachytherapy, because that dose can get so high so quickly, it's also advised that you have an instantaneous readout device on hand with you as well. So, and that may just be another survey meter that you have on hand if you're to walk, if you're the first one walking into the room after treatment, just to make sure that, you, that you're safe, that everything is okay. And then in terms of emergency procedures, so again, you know, source gets stuck, what do we do? There's actually going to be towards the end of our program, another session that expressly covers the emergency procedures. So I'm not going to go into them in any more detail here, but I need to say that everybody needs to be aware of what those emergency procedures are, but rest assured that will be covered several weeks, several weeks from now. So we just have our final poll question, and this is probably good. I think people have already asked me this question. So a uh, wipe test of the container of a newly received HDR source gave a reading of 50 decays per minute. Is this okay? And what should you do next? So answer A, this is fine. Go and install the source in the afterloader. Do your source strength measurement. Part B is this is fine install the source in the afterloader and do a survey around the afterloader and then see this is not okay, install the source in the afterloader and then contact the authorities, the shipping company and the manufacturer. And then the last option is this is not okay, you put the container in a safe place and then contact the authorities, the shipping company and the manufacturer. So I will stop sharing and let's see how we go. So that's 50 uh, dpm per centimetre squared. Sorry, I should have had the units correct. And I know it's a hard question. I'm expecting you to know the tolerance. <laughs> but let's have a guess. There's a question in the chat also. How do you prevent HDR accidents? How do we prevent HDR accidents? So, wow. Yeah. That's like a whole nother <laughs> two-hour lecture. We'll um, just stop. I, Three, two, one. Okay. Stop. Here we go. People are amazing. I love it. I love it. Okay, 60% said D. All right, let's do the screen sharing. Okay. And D is the correct answer. Well done. So for those of you that didn't remember, the tolerance for the contamination test is 22 decays per minute per centimeter squared. So if we've done a wipe test and we've got 50, this is too high. Okay, so this is not okay. So if we suspect there's contamination, we should never ever install the source in the afterloader. Okay, so if we think it's contaminated, we put the container somewhere safe, lock it away, and then we contact the appropriate people to help us deal with this issue. So 
Great job, people have been listening. I love it. So just quickly to go back to that check question, how do we prevent hastier accidents? This is going to be the topic of the entire program, really. It's too broad a question, unfortunately, for me to answer quickly. Part, the first part of preventing HDR accidents is doing radiation safety procedures. So it's doing contamination tests. It's doing, you know, source checks of the afterloader. It's doing radiation surveys. So in terms of accidents, accidents can be human error. Accidents can be machine error. So we do what we can to prevent the human error. And then by doing our quality assurance on all the equipment, we do what we can to prevent equipment error as well. So I guess that's the best answer I can give to that. But hopefully by the end of this program, you'll be able to answer that question yourself anyway. So let's see. So here are just, a, again, you, you should get copies of the slides. Just a couple of really good references in terms of radiation safety and receiving sources and international recommendations and bits and pieces. They're kind of your key, your key documents really for radiation safety. <music>